until they played a sound that she had heard. She was so terrified she she didn't feel safe. I'm Lauren Smith. I am the host of Nightcaller's Bigfoot Radio, and I am a legacy researcher. So I was raised up in the field of Bigfoot research. And so I, um, I've i been doing this for over 20 years. And most people, when they hear that, they just look very confused um, as to how like I could be, uh, have done this for over 20 years. So my mother, um, when I was preteen age, my mother, uh, she, she was bored one night and she was searching through pal talk. And I know a lot of people that listen to this may not remember what pal talk is, but it was chat rooms back in the day, but chat rooms where you could talk to each other. And she came across this chat room about Bigfoot and she laughed. Oh, she laughed. She thought that was just hysterical that these people believed in Bigfoot. And so she listened for a while and she would listen uh, night after night just because it was great comedic material for her until they played a sound that she had heard. And this sound had really impacted her. It was a sound that terrified her so bad that she was out fishing on the lake with her husband and her father-in-law. And the sound came out of the woods and it was so terrifying that she, even though she was on a boat in the middle of the water, she was so terrified. She, she didn't feel safe. She felt, you know, it was kind of that irrational fear of it's going to come across the water and get me. And so she talked her husband and father-in-law into taking her back to the boat ramp and going home. Um, she hadn't thought about that sound in a while. And then um, they played that sound in the Bigfoot chat room and she just couldn't believe it. She was like, what, what is this? And so then she became interested. She wanted to know more and more. So she started talking to these people. She became friends with these people and she had expeditions with these people. She would go on their property or have them come to her house. We lived in a lakeside community on Lake Sam Rayburn in Texas. And um, in the year 2000, she actually had her first sighting. Uh, this kind of changed the game for everything for me, for her, my whole life. Um, she had a sighting across the street from her house. Um, again, she lived in a little lakeside community in the woods um, and she had a full sighting. And so after that, it was, you know, whenever I would be with her, we would go out in the woods, we would go on expeditions with other people. Um, so I spent my entire life uh, with her collecting data, collecting evidence, um, compiling data. So at let's say 12 years old, I'm sitting behind a computer and we are compiling data on sightings versus moon phases. Um, we're out in the woods looking for hair, looking for tree structures, looking for tree bows and X formations. We're looking for um, tracks, of course, and evidence of Bigfoot. Uh, so, you know, some kids grow up and they they go to Disney or summer camp or Bible camp or whatever. Um, I grew up in the woods looking for Bigfoot. So it was kind of completely different than uh, most kids grow up. I grew up weird, which I'm OK with. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so I've had a few experiences over the years, of course, but I have not had a confirmed sighting. Um, you know, it's kind of the nature of the beast. Um, she has had five confirmed sightings and. Um, yeah, so I now uh, take my own children out in the woods. So I'm I'm passing on that that legacy researcher status. So amazing. Uh, well, tell me uh, the sound that she heard um, out in the boat, the one that initially scared her so much. Mm -hmm. What did that sound like? So she said that, you know, you've, um, so she looked up, uh, mountain lion screams. She looked up bobcat screams, foxes. It didn't match any of those. She said it was like a, <clears throat> the most terrifying roar you could hear. And she said it didn't, she couldn't describe it as anything, uh, like a lion or a dinosaur or anything like that. It was just this roar scream, <clears throat> very primal. I'm sorry. I'm having allergies this morning. Um, very primal scream that came out of the woods and, um, it just, it, the hair rose up on her neck and she was honestly terrified. She said, I had that irrational fear that it was going to swim under the water and come get me. It was, it was utterly terrifying, but it wasn't like a mountain lion scream. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard one of those. Those are <clears throat> like a woman screaming. It's absolutely terrifying. 
Well, um, it, but it wasn't like the chatter. It wasn't like those samurai, samurai sounds. No, it wasn't like that. Um, so it was, it was a full guttural primal scream from the woods, but it was a roar. I, d- I don't know. So it wasn't really a, I don't know how to describe it. Just like if you can imagine a Bigfoot standing in the middle of the woods and then they just like scream and ro- like it's a roar scream as loud as they can. That's what it sounded like to her. It was utterly terrifying. And so when they played that in the Bigfoot chat, she just she couldn't believe it. She was like, that's exactly what I heard. And <clears throat> it doesn't sound like any other known wildlife that I've ever heard. And we don't have bears or anything like that in East Texas. So it wasn't like a bear roar or, a, you know, it shouldn't be a lion roar um, or anything like that. So it was it changed the game. Um, that's what got her kind of interested. And then her sighting got her hooked. And it was just game on from then then and there. Well, tell me about her first sighting. Obviously, she was she was home, right? Right. So she was on she was home. She was sitting on her front porch on the phone with another Bigfoot researcher, actually. And um, across the street from our house, and I use street very loosely. It's a it's a road. Let's just say um, there was a bamboo thicket, and then just the national forest behind it. <clears throat> and she was on the phone with her res- her fellow researcher and she kept hearing things she kept hearing something moving over there and she said i am hearing something walking around across from my house i can hear it and um he said well why don't you shine your spotlight and so she popped up her spotlight and panned it and then panned back and sure enough next to this big tree there's a bigfoot standing there and it, it, she could see you know this half of his body or i guess his whole face and then just his body she said he was black like black fur um he was tall and lanky like a basketball player but like solid like he you could tell it was just he's very muscular and um and she said she she looked at it and she recoiled in fear because it was her first sighting and it terrified her um and when she recoiled in fear and dropped the light and looked back he was gone so she said after that she she kind of she kind of blacked out um she said that she remembers seeing it she remembers telling him i'm seeing one i'm seeing one and then the next thing she remembers she was sitting on the couch and she it was like 6 to 8 hours later and she doesn't remember what happened during that time and it was almost like her mind was protecting itself because that's a lot i hear a lot from witnesses um that this thing is not supposed to exist, right? This is not supposed to be on this planet. And so whenever you do have a sighting, it can really mess with your mind and your brain tries to protect itself. First, um, usually your brain will tell you that you didn't see what you saw and it will start coming up with all kinds of explanations. It was a bear, even though we don't have bears. Um, It was a tree, you know, just um, your brain tries to protect itself. And so hers kind of shut down. Um, After that, she kind of came to she called her friend in dallas which is about two three hours away um her friend is also a researcher and she said kelly i had a sighting she said and i I need you to come you know help me look for evidence and stuff so kelly drove down and they went across the street to the the area where it would have been standing um when they got over there next to the tree was a really worn spot like there was no grass no pine needles it was just bare worn hard packed earth where this thing had been standing and watching her for a long time and she always felt watched in that house and anytime she would go off the trails into the woods and um she gives full interviews on this with more detail than i'm giving of course um but she it was worn he had been standing there watching her for a while And, um, there was an odor. She said it was unlike anything she ever smelled before, but they couldn't find the source of the odor. They looked and they were like, there's gotta be, you know, an animal here, like something giving off the smell. There was no source for the smell, but it was the worst smell. She said it was like decomposing animal and vomit. It was awful. Like really, you know, musk overload. It was, it was awful. So she had Kelly, um, take a PVC pipe and put a hat on it and then poke it up to where mom saw the face because there was a pine knot next to the thing's face um, when she shined the spotlight. So she went back across the street and she said, okay, hold it up. 
and Kelly held it up. And so she said, well, hold it up more and more and more. It ended up being eight foot tall or I'm sorry, 11 foot tall. Um, I always say eight foot. It's 11 foot tall, um, which to me boggles my mind. I, I can't imagine something that tall. I can't even imagine anything eight foot tall, much less 11 foot tall. Um, it's hard telling someone else's story. Uh, so anyway, she she held it up to the pine knot and it was 11 foot tall. And she just, she said, that's it. That's that's where it's at. And they measured and, you know, just it, it utterly blows your mind that something that big could exist in our forests. And it's, I mean, I, I know I go look at my ceilings usually and I'm just like, how could something that big be in the, in the forest? Like something that big towering over you and they don't generally harm us and they don't, you know, they could take us out and they, they don't. And it's just, it's mind boggling. Um, but you know, that they exist and they haven't been found, but they're that big. It's, it's crazy. It's amazing. Do you think she suspected that there was something there all along? She did. Um, she did. She, cause like I said, she always felt watched. She said, especially when she would wash dishes right there, she would always feel watched. Um, whenever she would go hike along the trails, she would feel watched every time. Um, we could generally tell when there was Sasquatch activity, we had this little Chihuahua dog cookie and cookie would like my mom would be hiking the trails and cookie would run off into the woods and go make a loop and explore and then come back to my mom. If we were having activity, cookie would be right there by her side. She would not leave. Um, also, um, the woods go completely silent when there is activity, you know, you'll have crickets and frogs and birds. And whenever there is a Sasquatch around the woods, will go silent most often. Um, so she could tell there was when there was something there, um, but even before that sighting, she knew, she knew that there was something that was watching. Um, she actually had another sighting at that same house. She had looked across the street. There was a trailer off to the right, like a, a single wide trailer down the street. And the people had, I guess they had lost power or something. They had a freezer full of rotten meat and they had put it out in the yard and they were going to deal with it when they got back again. This is like these houses are like everybody's lake houses. And so they would come up, you know, 4th of July weekend and then not come back for months. So these houses, a lot of them were vacant. There were a few residents that lived there permanently, but most of these houses were vacant. And so um, she looked over because she heard something. She looked over and there was a different Sasquatch. And he, he I, I guess, had rifled through that freezer of rotten meat. And he was carrying the meat. But she said... <laughs> Whereas the other one was this tall, lanky, black-furred um, Sasquatch. This one was short and red-furred and hunched over. And he had a, she said he had a pot belly on him, like a like a beer belly. And he was carrying this meat and just hunched over and, and running into the woods. And um, so there were two, uh, you know, I think probably a whole family unit, but there were two different types of Sasquatch in the same area off of Lake Sam Rayburn. Well, that's just amazing that, that she had the two sightings, but uh, going back to the, the first sighting, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, she kind of went into a shock state for, mm -hmm. for that duration of time to, in order to give her, her mind up the ability to even process what it was that she potentially saw. Right. Um, so she has seen five that's just remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, understand that she lives in an area, obviously, that there are, right. you know, some, but have they all been in this general vicinity or have, have you branched out to other places for the other sightings that she had? Yes. Um, so, you know, that's five over the span of 20 years. And so, you know, because a lot of people will be like five, that's just that seems like an awful lot. I don't know. And I'm like, that's over a 20 year span. And that's not a normal um, that's not a normal human going out into the woods to hike when they feel like it. That is her dedication to going out into different areas to research and look for evidence of these beings. So it's, um, that's, that's five with hard work going out time after time after time with consistency over a 20 year span. Um, so that's five out of, you know, let's just say 365 days a year, that's five times out of that times 20. So, I mean, it's, 
the amount of time she didn't see one is a lot. Um, so there, a few of them were in that area, but the others were in other areas, other states even. Um, I believe that she has, so she lives now in the Nacogdoches area versus Lufkin area. And her last sighting was on her property in the Nacogdoches area. And it was um, an old she says he's old um and an elderly bigfoot he is he had gray he had like a silver color and um she was dumping some roofing material and she went to dump the material and looked up she felt something there she looked up and there he stood and he kind of looked at her she looked at him and then he just walked off um that was her last sighting in between that um i think she had her other sighting in alabama i want to say um, she was on an outing there and she had a sighting. She's had a lot of, um, seeing something, you know, standing and move behind a tree or something walking, um, you know, walking behind the trees or something like that, but she doesn't really count those. So she's had a lot of those, but she doesn't count them. She counts face-to-face sightings of something she is seeing. So the, the amount of sightings she's had of just partial sightings or she's had a ton of those and she doesn't count them though. Um, so yeah, mostly in the Texas area, uh, East Texas area is where she has seen these. So you haven't had an encounter yourself, but obviously you've gone out and done a lot of research. So yes. you've seen evidence of Bigfoot, however? Yes. Um, so I have had experiences, but I have not had a full sighting. So um, the closest I've had is I was at at my mom's property. She has a very active property. Um, and we do what we call porch squatching. And so, um, late at night after everyone's asleep, she and I will go sit out on her screened porch and we will just observe. And, you know, we may do a call or something that's very rare, but we just mostly observe. Um, and I had, it was a full moon and I had seen eye shine, um, down at the, there's a creek down the hill from her house. And so I had seen eye shine moving along that creek and I watched it kind of like it would be here and then it would be here and then it was closer. And it was a, it was different than any other eye shine I had seen. So the most eyes eye shine that I've seen, it's been a um, yellow orange or a, a white yellow type of color. This was a a pale blue, like almost a white blue, but very dim. And I saw it and I looked, I was like, oh, I was like, that's eye shine, you know? And I didn't really say anything because it was, you know, I see that a lot. And then I looked up a little while later and um, <clears throat> it was the light off the fur, I think, that caught my attention. And I saw the outline of a Bigfoot. And I... I'm very good at talking myself out of things. Um, like, no, no, that's not what it is. And so I leaned forward and I'm leaning off of my chair. Like I almost fell face first off my chair and I'm leaning forward. And I was just like, mom, mom, I think, um, I think, I think, and I'm looking and this thing in it, it just all of a sudden, like it was standing there. And then all of a sudden there's nothing there. And I could see the deer feet are behind it. <clears throat> and so, um, she was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, I said, I saw like the light reflecting on its fur. And then I saw the outline because it was a full moon. And so we, um, the next day I went over there and looked and measured where the deer feeder was. It was about six, seven foot in the air. And then, um, I looked on the ground, I looked for evidence. I couldn't find anything. And it was, it was a little bit disappointing, but I knew I had seen something. Um, I've had a lot of weird experiences out on her property, like a lot. Um, the so I got growled at out on her property. Uh, this was years ago when we Night Callers Bigfoot Radio. We started it um, in 2011 or 2008, and um, so we've been going over a decade with this podcast. R- now it's a YouTube regular podcast. We have podcast platforms, but back in the day, it was Blog Talk Radio, which was a call in platform with a chat. And so, um, we were on a live show and these people, we would do a live show. We would all call in and then we would go live while we researched the area, which now you have, 
um, Facebook Live and stuff like that. But this was without video. So it was the audio was terrible, but it was a great time. Anyway, we had just finished a live show and I was sitting on the porch. She was down at the other end and she was on the phone and I was sitting there and I saw I shine off to the left and I looked and I was like, whoa, I said that was I shine. I'm talking to myself, of course, because, you know, she's way over there. And um, and I was I saw it again a little further along and I was like, OK, I was like, wow, it's moving. And I didn't see it again. And there's these um tall bushes. They're like five, six foot tall bushes. Um, I don't know what kind of plant it is, but it was about 10, 15 foot off the porch and it's between two trees. And I looked at those and I thought to myself, like that intrusive thought of, man, what if it was like behind those bushes and it was watching us and like creeped up on us? Like, and it was kind of like a joke in my head. And as I looked at the bushes, it growled at me. Um, whatever had been walking, it growled. And this growl shook my body. Like I could feel it in my chest. And it wasn't you know, when a dog growls, it's at a certain decibel and you, you, it's scary, of course, but it's a, that low growl. Well, this was whatever made this growl, its chest had to be, I mean, just a big barrel chest to make the level that this thing came out and the the way it shook my chest. And my first reaction was that I was offended. I could not believe that it dared to growl at me on my porch. Um, and then the fear set in. And I, when I say fear, I mean full fight or flight. And I had to physically hold the bottom of my chair and pull my body into the chair so that I wouldn't take off running into the house. Um, the only thing that stopped me is, you know, I'm a great daughter and I didn't want my mom to be eaten. So I sat there and I was just like, mom, mom, mom. And I'm whispering like it doesn't know I'm talking. And she's like, what? And I was like, did you hear that? And she kind of looked at me weird, like, it's like she was um, considering. She was looking at my face and kind of like, hear what? And I was like, uh, at the growl. I said, did you hear the growl? And she's like, looking at me, she goes, that was a semi truck on the highway. And she lives 20 minutes past the middle of nowhere. Like, you can't hear a semi truck on the highway. And I was just like, no, it wasn't. And she's like, yeah, yeah, it was. And I'm just like, okay, whatever. And I just sat there for a little bit longer. And then I finally got up and I went inside. Um, my ex-husband, you know, husband at the time was laying on the couch and I woke him up and I was like freaking out. And he looked at me. He's like, what's wrong? He said I was white, like white as a sheet and clammy. He said it looked like I'd seen a ghost. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, it growled at me. It growled at me. And he's like, what? And I was like, a Bigfoot, a Bigfoot growled at me. And I'm freaking out. And he's like, OK, you know, and like I calmed down. Well, later on, like, I don't know, maybe a week or two later, I finally asked her. I was like, mom, because I was pissed at this point. I'm like, you really didn't hear that growl? And she's like, I heard it. She's like, I heard it and I felt it. She's like, but you were so terrified. She said, I, I just felt like I needed to say it was something else because you were so scared in that moment. And so it was kind of nice that she finally validated me. Um, but it was, that was the single most terrifying thing that had happened to me um, in my life, much less uh, as a Bigfoot researcher. And I was in my 20s at that time. So I had gone out with her on expeditions. We had stayed the night in tents in the middle of nowhere, um, heard really horrifying, scary stories about Bigfoot before staying in the tent in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I had been scared a lot growing up um, researching with her. There were quite a few times where it was, it was mama, can we go mama? Can we go? But this was the first time something had happened actually to me. And, um, it, it scared me for a long time and it kind of, I, I couldn't think of anything else that would be that big to make that kind of, that level of growl at me. So it was, that was utterly terrifying. I, if I could, um, I wish that I could replicate it. I wish that I could find a recording that sounded anything like it. How did that growl sound to um, your mother in comparison to her, that first sound that she had when she was out in the boat? Um, not even the same. So the growl, when it growled at me, it was like a warning growl because I was looking directly at it. And I guess he thought he had gotten away with sneaking up on us until I looked directly at the base of those bushes. And he just, you know, it was kind of a warning growl, like, hey, don't look over here. Pretend like you don't see me, you know, or whatever. Um, her audio, her 
experience. It was this primal scream roar type of thing that it, <clears throat> it wasn't a growl. It was um, hers was more something just, you know, bellowing out in the woods at top volume. So completely different. <laughs> She's had other experiences, and obviously you've <clears throat> done a lot of footwork out there yeah. and research. Um, what else can you tell me about what you've discovered? So over the years, you know, when we first started researching, there were there were hundreds of us in the United States, but not near as many as now. And when we first started, finding Bigfoot hadn't come out yet. So Bigfoot was very taboo. You didn't talk about it at work. You didn't talk about it at church or, you know, in your social circles. This was not a thing you talked about. Um, So the main form of communication between Bigfoot researchers was on forums or chat rooms. Um, We didn't have Facebook groups. We didn't have, you know, even... <clears throat> In your town, you didn't even know another person that believed in Bigfoot or researched Bigfoot. Like there was, this was not a widespread thing then. So <clears throat> the research methods back then, we did do tree knocks and have success. Um, we did look for tracks and have success casting tracks. Um, we were all trying different things. We did do calls. You know, we did audio recorders with cassette players like you would set up a cassette tape recorder that's how you recorded um we didn't have audio like digital audio recorders um i knew one person with night vision and it was very expensive for a civilian to have night vision i did not know anyone else with night vision thermal was not a thing um and so this is how i grew up and the reason i say that is that over the past 20 years <clears throat> we have I have found that things that used to work don't work anymore in the Bigfoot research world. And so it's kind of that adage of what you study, you also change. And so tree knocks, um, we have since through our research discovered that tree knocks are um, what we believe to be sentinels, uh, the Bigfoot sentinels. They knock when, because we had experienced several times, and this is again in the Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas area. This is not, this may not apply to other areas, but we, when we would enter the woods, we would hear a knock. And then when we left, we would hear a knock, but no other time while we were in the woods. And so we believed it was a sentinel letting, letting the others know, Hey, there's a human in the woods. And so we got to the point where we realized that when we do a tree knock, we're letting them know there's a human in the woods. And so that was kind of went against uh, what we were trying to do, which is sneak up on them, which is absolutely ludicrous. So that's their house. That's their living room. They know when you're in their living room. Um, same for game cams over the years. Um, game cams just have not been successful uh, because again, I use the adage of you're sitting. So you, you, you leave your house, you go to work, you come home and somebody has put a camera on your coffee table you're going to notice the camera because it's not supposed to be in your house. Right. Um, so that's the same thing with game cams. They know when something has been added or altered. Usually um, you can hide them <clears throat> with some success. Um, audio recorders, all of that. So I, we don't use game cams. I wish that they had worked. That would be amazing. I, I love the idea behind it. I love how inventive people get with it, but they don't generally work because they know they're there. Um, Audio recorders are a little bit different. Uh, sometimes people can get away with those. Um, and I've seen some really great setups. Olympic Project has great setups. Um, and a, a couple of private individuals have, I mean, they go all out putting them inside logs and all kinds of stuff. And they get some really great audio evidence with those. Um, so over the years, we have collected fur. We've collected scat. Um, I have found one track that was that I personally found my mother has found some but for me one track that um just I, I couldn't believe it I was out actually hiking around the Falk area with my kids and um we had left camp for a little bit to go explore and we were hiking and what's crazy is we had been there the week before and I we were walking along there and I just kind of happened to look down and I saw this track and the, the reason I was looking down because <clears throat> this area, we had just been there. Um, when we were hiking, I found my lip gloss on the ground from the week before. And I was like, oh my God, 
gosh, that's what happened to that. And I stuck it in my pocket. And so I was looking down like, that's so crazy. I wonder if I lost anything else while I was out here, you know? And um, I saw this track and I immediately grabbed the kids. I'm like, wait, 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 wait. I'm like, come here, come here. I'm like, do you guys see that? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, let's follow the track way. Can you guys find another print? Because I'm all about teaching the next generation how to research, right? And just getting them out in the woods and, you know, off their screens and all that. And so they found the next track. And so I'm not a perfect researcher. I'm not a professional researcher. I did not cast it. I didn't have any casting material with me, but I didn't have any uh, casting. I had a tape measure in my pocket, completely forgot. I took pictures of it and I was just so excited that I didn't do my due diligence. And, but I sent the track of the picture to a fellow researcher in the Arkansas area. And I said, I found this. I said, I'm very excited about it. Um, I said, but it looks rather long and, and very slim to me. I said, I, I'm not sure. I just want to kind of get some validation. And he said, well, he said it is a Bigfoot track. He said the the female Bigfoot in that area have long, slim tracks and the uh, males have kind of thicker um flat tracks. And so it was, it was great to get that validation. I actually did send you a picture of that one. Um, I've never shared that track online ever. So, uh, I kind of took, took a chance sending that to you. Um, but I kind of wanted just to support that, you know, that's kind of, that's how rare evidence is. And I, I know people that it seems like they find a track every time they go out. Um, maybe they're just better trackers than I am, which is completely fine. Um, I am, I like to go out and have, you know, I I like to go out and, and experience. So, um, I'm an empath. And so when I go out, I kind of use a different set of skills to research, um, less physical and more vibe related, um, if that makes sense. And so I, I focus more on feeling when they're there and it's, um, you know, kind of feeling that I call it my spidey sense of, you know, there's something here and, um, I can usually feel it in my chest. Like I, I just, there's this, it feels almost like anxiety. <laughs> I don't know how else to describe that, but it's a, a pressure on my chest and, um, and then I'll get like cold chills and stuff. Um, this has also been linked with infrasound. So whenever someone's getting blasted with infrasound, usually me, um, it's kind of almost that same feeling, but along with the infrasound will come feelings of, um, lethargy, um, extreme fear, uh, stuff like that. So it just kind of depends on the situation. But, um, so as for evidence, like the infrasound, it's, that's one of those things that is very hard to scientifically collect evidence for because it's a, it's a feeling. But, um, I, I talked with a researcher recently on my show and he said that they are working on, <clears throat> using um so he's in a band he plays a guitar and so they're working on using their musical equipment audio equipment to record the sound of infrasound and then put that up <clears throat> in an audio like audacity or something like that and record the low decibel level of infrasound and so he said we basically just need a way to get the infrasound know when it's happening so we can record it and then put it over here and look at it and see what it looks like. And I said, well, you have a human barometer right here. I can tell you when it's happening. I just need to know scientifically, I would like to be verified that it is happening. And so that's kind of one of the tools I use. Um, but uh, audio recorder, you know, I've gotten a lot of great audio. My mom actually has a, a YouTube channel um, she decided to start because she has 20 years of research and audio. And so she put up a YouTube channel to start putting her audio up so that people could learn um, from her, uh, from her audio, uh, learn from her mistakes. So she has hogs uh, sounds on there. She has owls, foxes, you know, all kinds of things on her YouTube. So you can know what to know what Bigfoot is. We need to know what Bigfoot is not or what is not Bigfoot. And so learning different wildlife sounds, you know, that kind of helps you know what is not Bigfoot. Um, learning what makes trees bow over or what causes weird formations in the forest, um, stuff like that. You need to know what naturally occurs in the forest so that you can know what is 
not or what is Bigfoot possible Bigfoot uh, evidence and and interaction. Let's talk a little bit about that, uh, the structures, the bend over trees. Um, give us an education on that. What what do we need to know if someone is out in the woods researching something, they see a bend over tree? Um, how do you know if it's Bigfoot created or if it's just something natural? Um, so first and foremost, you know, not everything is Bigfoot. And I tell people that in, I give a presentation and um, I tell people that, you know, not everything is Bigfoot. So um, a lot of times people, um, especially people that are new to the topic, they're very passionate and excited and they see something weird in the woods and they're like, oh, it must be Bigfoot. And um, no, not necessarily. Mother Nature can do some very strange things. And I mean, very strange things, things you would not, you just can't believe that this happened naturally. Um, so for stick structures, uh, you know, cause I've seen some very weird things I've seen. Oh, I've seen some weird things. Um, I've seen structures that look like an Adderisk, basically. I mean, it's just all like these sticks that have fallen together and it's so weird. And I was just like, there's no way that that's natural. Like, how did that happen? Um, until I started looking around and I realized that it was a floodplain. And so these sticks had been all woven together whenever it flooded and the water kind of circled around this tree and the sticks were woven together. Water receded and it's up six foot in a tree but that's how high the water got. And, you know, this was in Falk, Arkansas area. Um, you know, there are, I have found um, sticks that you have to look. So let's say you come across a stick structure and there are branches that are laid over each other and you're like, oh my gosh, Bigfoot did it. Um, look around and make sure that those branches didn't come from the trees around them. So if you have, you know, three pine boughs, you know, let's say that are laid over each other and you're like, oh, Bigfoot did it for sure. And you look and there are pine trees around there. Mother nature could have done that, you know, wind, storms, flooding, um, you know, and also keep in mind that humans can do weird stuff too. Um, there's a lot of stick structures out there that are built into huts. Humans do this. Boy Scouts, um, homeless people, hikers, um, through hikers do a lot of that, as well as, um, believe it or not, there are people that just go off and live in the woods sometimes um, on public land and such. So just keep in mind that humans do a lot of that um, rock stacking. You know, there's um, trail markers that they do rock stacking. A lot of people are like, Bigfoot did it because it's out here in the middle of nowhere. And I'm like, you're out there in the middle of nowhere. There's no way to say a human didn't do that. So you have to have a level of skepticism when you're doing this um, because not everything is Bigfoot. That's a big tagline in my research. Not everything is Bigfoot. So the stick structures, make sure that the trees, make sure that it couldn't have happened naturally first. So make sure that the, the branches that are there did not come from any surrounding trees. Um, look and see because you know sometimes there will be a branch under a branch and then they're kind of woven together and fed through um a lot of times i see a branch that is literally woven through live trees um those are really weird and those are the ones that kind of you know kind of raise my my hackles a little i'm like hmm i'm like i just don't know how naturally you know cuz i could see if it fell fell and then kind of got hooked behind a tree, but to be woven around the next tree, that's, and this is like a 12 foot long branch. This is huge. A human could not really lift this unless there was a team of humans doing it, which is possible. So that lens, you know, not everything is Bigfoot, but verify before you jump to that conclusion. Um, for tree bows, I mean, a lot of times trees will be knocked over, um, so a branch was in a storm and it knocked the tree over and it's pinning it down. Um, that happens a lot. Another branch has fallen on it and pinned it down. And then that branch rolled away and the thing is still, you know, laid over. Um, so you have to look around for the evidence of what happened to this tree. And if you cannot find any, then maybe you can say this is possible Bigfoot evidence. Um, a lot of tree, um, twists, uh, those can happen naturally. 
Um, but a lot of times that is, you know, alleged evidence of Bigfoot because they are the only thing strong enough to twist these trees and break them over. Um, look for, of course, tracks. Um, look for hair in in those tree twists. Sometimes you can find loose hair in those or hair that got stuck in them. Not often, but sometimes you can. So make sure to look for those. Um, you know, just you have to look around and make sure that absolutely be sure that it could not have happened naturally. Well, that's, that's good to know. If you're out there researching, you need to know the difference between a natural occurrence and something that might be an indicator of an actual Bigfoot area. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go kind of in another direction. Um, since you're out there in the field, you've done your homework out there, you're looking for all these your physical evidence, including sightings. And certainly your mother's had a huge amount of, uh, of time out there looking for this, these things. Have you seen anything unusual like the orbs or UFOs or anything of that sort? Um, yes. So I had, I, I have seen a UFO, but that was not Bigfoot related. Um, unfortunately, I wish that I had seen it at the same time of a Bigfoot ex experience, because that's a question I ask on my podcast a lot of guests is, um, have you had a UFO experience and a Bigfoot experience at the same time? So far, I think maybe two people have. So, um, cause that's a theory that I definitely want to try to flush out, but I can't. Um, so the orb, yes, I was in, um, the Southeastern Oklahoma in the mountains, we were staying in a cabin a big group of researchers and to me and another researcher had gone down the mountain and we used um, just red light. We didn't have our lights on or anything. And we went down the mountain quite a bit. I mean, it was a long ways from the cabin and we found this little area of boulders and it was in a little clearing. And so we decided we were going to post up there and hear what we hear. And so we sat, um, kind of with our backs facing so I could see his face he could see my face but our you know watching each other's backs basically is what we how we would research and we sat there for a while and we could hear movement and he said I'm getting movement over in that direction and I said I'm looking at it I said there's a shadow over there and I would see a brief glimpse of a shadow enough to make you go is that it is that a shadow you know um but, and then it would move and I would see it over here. And I was like, okay, I said, something is circling us. Like we can hear the footprints. And then when it was at my 12 o'clock, I saw a blue orb again. It was the same color as the eye shine that I had me recently mentioned about uh, the, like that white blue, pale blue, but it was very dim. It wasn't like a shining. It was very dim. And I looked and I looked at it and I said, I'm seeing an orb. I used more colorful language when I said it, but I said, I'm seeing an orb. And I was irrationally angry because I didn't want orbs to exist. I am there to find Bigfoot. I've been doing this for 20 years. I still haven't had a sighting, but I'm seeing an orb. So I was irrationally angry about it. Um, later on, I would realize like that was kind of cool because I have had a lot of a lot of guests on my show that have had experiences with orbs. So this was kind of nice to tie that in um, and verify it myself with my own sighting. But it stayed there for a few minutes and I looked around and it was gone. And so we sat there and I said, I, I saw an orb. I just saw an orb. And he's like, okay. And so we looked to see where the highway was because there was a little snaking highway that was before you get to the road to the cabin. Um, and every once in a while you could see headlights. And so we looked where that was and it was completely off to the side, was not even close to where I saw the orb. And so I was like, well, okay, well, maybe it was... Um, Maybe it was a shining on a leaf, you know, the moon shining on a leaf. And so I kept looking and I was like, no, that wasn't it. It was, it was like the size of a baseball, which is that. Um, and it was the size of a baseball and it just sat there for a minute and it kind of, it didn't move, but it wasn't completely stationary. And then it just went away. And um, anyway, so the, it was just so weird that we were having Bigfoot activity and then this orb pops up. We look at that. And after the orb went away, we didn't have any other activity. It was gone. It was, it was very unexplainable. 
some people seem to have um, an experience with orbs becoming Bigfoot and Bigfoot becoming orbs, kind of that interchangeable thing. Right. Do you think that is what happened? I am open-minded and I try to be open-minded, um, especially on my show, because I have so many guests that come on with paranormal experiences involving Bigfoot. Um, you know, the woo is what they call it, but, and I'm very supportive of it because I think that <clears throat> we are researching a mythical being um, <clears throat> already. Like we're already researching something that should not be on this planet. Um something that shouldn't exist. So we should be open-minded. Um, but I feel that it's very hard to wrap your, wrap your mind around Bigfoot existing, much less Bigfoot being able to be interdimensional or, um, travel into like condense into an orb and travel like Glinda the Good Witch, um, or jump out of a portal. It it's, it's hard for people to wrap their minds around that when they can't even wrap their mind around Bigfoot. But I tell people all the time, we don't need to get tunnel vision um, because we don't know what these things are capable of. We don't know if they have access to a different part of their brain than we do um, and have abilities that we don't have or that we used to have that we don't have anymore because we have smartphones and, you know, it's like after we invented the wheel and fire, you know, we kind of lost a lot of our um, abilities that I think they still have. So I want to believe that these things are flesh and blood. However, um, more and more comes out that lends credibility to the fact that they may not be just flesh and blood. So I am trying to be open minded. It is a little bit hard for me to say that the Bigfoot did, in fact, turn into an orb. Um, I just know that there have been a lot of witness accounts of orbs while having Bigfoot activity. And so I think that's as far as I could go to say that is that. Um, you know, let's say that these things, you know, are more in touch with their, you know, Native American roots than we are, and they have spirits around them that may be an orb or something like that, that I'm, I believe in the paranormal and I, I'm quite, I see ghosts and all of that. So that's easier for me to stomach than a Bigfoot turning into an orb. If that, if that kind of makes sense, like it's easier for me to say that maybe they travel with spirits or something than, I don't know. So that's, that's how, you know, the brain works. It, it, it accepts what it can. <laughs> well, I don't know if you've discovered this in, in the interviews that you've done or not, but, um, but oftentimes the, um, the way that ghosts, UFOs, alien beings, and cryptids are described at times, they seem to follow somewhat of a similar pattern. I don't know if you've mm -hmm. experienced that or not. The comings and goings appear, disappear, um, kind of an elusive sense of them. They're there, but mm -hmm. they're not there. Right. Um, being able to see through them, being able to suddenly you know, poof, be gone. Um anything like that, you know, they're made of energy is what the belief is, is that the, it's an inner, the energy. So that's what you feel. And so there could be something to be said for um, the Bigfoot. So like the infrasound that they use, for instance, that's energy, that's directed energy that um, is sound waves, you know? And so I've never heard of being able to see through a Bigfoot. I have heard of um, people saying that they cloak of um, invisible, like they, like looking through a plastic film. I have heard that experience before. Um, well, I watched it on Missing 411, I believe. Um, but the appearing and disappearing, like you said, they're very elusive. And so that could be explained rationally or scientifically as, you know, just camouflaging. They're very, very, very good at camouflaging. And so if they were to literally, the reason that we usually see them as movement, um, you know, aside from my mom shining her spotlight directly at this thing's face, um, you know, this is usually we see them because of movement. If they are standing stock still and have camouflaged themselves with dappled leaves, you know, and they blend in and they look like a tree or part of a forest background. You don't know they're there. And it's not so much that they have disappeared, um, you know, faded into nothingness and, and you know, all of that. It's that they, they can camouflage very well. Also, these things have the most... 
extreme musculature that you can imagine. Um, I've had several accounts shared with me about they moved so quick and so fast. It was like they had muscles in places that we definitely don't. And the amount of muscles to move that bulk that fast is just, it, you, you, it boggles the mind. And so, for instance, one of them, uh, one encounter, this person was seeing a female Bigfoot that was like paralleling him in the woods. And he would move and it would move. He would move, it would move, but it was moving behind a tree every time. And when he went to move and then he stopped and she moved without him moving and he saw her. And at that time she took off running and he said it was from a standstill to a full leap sprint and she was gone. He said it was the fastest thing he had ever seen. And so, you know, whenever they just disappear, um, like that either they can camouflage very well and they just, they disappear from your line of sight or they can literally take off. They can swing up into a tree. They can take off running. They can belly crawl. These things can kind of disappear naturally, um, in a way that we can't wrap our minds around because we can't do it, but that doesn't mean that it's not real, um, that they can do it. Um, not to mention they're very elusive. They're very good at rapidly getting away from you quietly. Um, sometimes they don't use that cautionary quiet and they bluff charge. They make a lot of noise. Um, but a lot of times they can quietly disappear from your line of sight. And with humans, that's kind of all they need to do. They just need to disappear from your line of sight. They don't really need to, you know, fade off into the ether. They just get out of your line of sight. Humans, you know, you'll go check around and then you'll become distracted and you'll go away. Um, you know, they've been doing this for so long that they kind of know us. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of, you know, I, I, they may be interdimensional. They may be, um, I've heard of the theory of the mammoth cave system, um, to where the cryptids, not just Bigfoot, but other cryptids even, uh, travel the mammoth cave system. So they, they can pop up in West Virginia. They can pop up over here. Um, that it's a fascinating theory. I don't know much about it. I just knew that when I heard it, I was like, that is just phenomenal. Like, can you imagine? Um, but also that the mammoth cave system has, a uh, paranormal qualities that can help them kind of interdimensional, you know, travel. So, um, but I, I don't know, I haven't had, I haven't personally had any experiences where they've done anything paranormal except for infrasound. So what do you think about the native American legends on Bigfoot and their association with Bigfoot being a spirit, more of a spirit being? Mm -hmm. um, so I have heard um, I have a friend who, uh, is part of the Navajo tribe and I got really excited whenever I first met him. And I was like, you know, I said, do your elders speak about Bigfoot in his, he kind of lost color in his face. And he was like, we, we don't talk about that. He said, um, the elders don't talk about that with us. They talked to, they spoke about it enough to say, we don't talk about that. Um, they are taboo. They are the shadow people. They have been banished um, and kind of, you know, pushed away. And so we don't talk about them because it's taboo and it brings bad luck. Um, so that's kind of that that particular tribe is what I've heard of that. Um, I haven't really heard very many um, personal accounts of um, Native Americans saying positive things about this creature. Um, I know the Cherokee call them baby eaters. They used to leave um, gifts at the edge of their territory um, for the Bigfoot so that they wouldn't come eat their women and children is the, what the legends would say. Um, so it's, I, I haven't heard a whole lot of positive things about these creatures from the Native Americans. So, Well, you have been a wealth of information <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think we probably would have another hour and hopefully you'll come back uh, and talk with me again sometime because you just have such a, a wonderful, vivid way of describing um, all of the research that you've done and your mother's experiences you. as well. So um, anything else you want to add before I, I close the meeting today? Um, just that, um, you know, whenever you're out there um, researching, 
Um, so I do a presentation called Little Footers, the Next Generation. And so I'm a really big proponent of of bringing the next generation on and training them. Um, and by the next generation, I don't just mean kids. Um, that can mean teenagers. That can mean people who are new to the topic. And so I believe that current researchers, it is our responsibility to train the these researchers on how to research correctly, um, rather than being um, ridiculing for blob squatch photos or, you know, um, gently tell them, you know, not everything is Bigfoot and, you know, stuff like that. But um, my point is I, I give this presentation and I believe in education. Um, education replaces fear. Um, and I believe in being kind. And so that is a huge thing that I do be safe, be kind. I end every show with that same adage. Um, when you're out there, make sure that you are being safe while you're out there. Um, whether, you know, Bigfoot is going to eat you or not or whatever. Um, it is still a, a, a wild, um, it is still a wild animal. It is still a creature of the forest and there are other creatures of the forest. So show respect when you're out there. Um, and be safe. Let someone know where you're at. Make sure that you have everything you need and be kind, not only to others, which I hope that you are because we have enough yuck in the world, but also to yourself. And that is what I'll leave you with.